delighted and honored to get to start this new series with you this morning. The Gospel of John is an incredible gospel. It's an incredible gospel that some people have equated to kind of a swimming pool in the sense that it's got a, 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 a one end where the baby pool is, where you can like get your feet in and enjoy the fun in the pool. But it's also got a deep end where you can dive in and just get fully submerged in it. And you can enjoy the gospel of John either way. What I'd like us to do in this class is dig into the gospel of John, and I'm going to try to do it in a way where if you're brand new to studying something like John, it's, it's easy for you to get right in. But while we'll be dabbling our toes in it, we will quickly be moving towards the deep end as well so that we can enjoy it in its fullness uh, as we try to, to uh, embrace it on a very significant level. So with that, let me start with a story. A couple of years ago, I had a chance to go to England and to meet with the dean of Canterbury Cathedral. Canterbury Cathedral is the principal location for the Church of England. It's very close to France, down near the coast of England on the southeast corner of England. And I was going to meet with him to discuss several things, but also just to see the, the Canterbury Cathedral experience. I had not been there before. I wanted to see where uh, 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 there was the... the death of Thomas Becket, uh, where he was beheaded uh, at the cathedral that caused Canterbury Tales and all of that kind of stuff to start up. This is a cathedral that's been around for over a thousand years, and I really was looking forward to seeing it. But I had to connect with the dean, and the way I was going to do that is I was going to meet his assistant outside the cathedral grounds in the streets of Canterbury. Now, there's a question. Which one is his assistant? There were a lot of people there. I'd never met her before. She'd never met me before. She knew which time train I was on, offered to meet me at the train station. I said, no, 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 because I wanted to experience Canterbury on my own a little bit first. I said, I'll just meet you there. And she told me something. She said, okay, at 11.45, I'll be standing outside this door. I'll be wearing a green coat with blue buttons. I'm proud to tell you, I picked her out off of the green coat. I did not have to walk up and start, what color are your buttons? What color are your buttons? Because there was only one lady with a green coat by that door. So I was able to walk up and say, hello, are you so-and-so? She said, yes, are you Mark? I said, I am. It's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you for taking me to visit with the dean. It was a, 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 an easy thing to do once I identified her. But the problem is we often need to determine how to identify someone and that is one of the reasons John wrote his gospel. He wanted people to have no doubt who Jesus was. See, Jesus was not simply God showing up on earth unannounced. Jesus was someone who God had ahead of time said... I'm going to send someone, and here's how you will know who he is. He didn't say, by this door at this time, wearing a green coat with blue buttons. But he was actually, in some ways, more specific. It didn't happen all at once. It unfolded over thousands of years. You can get your first glimpse from the Old Testament when Adam and Eve are being kicked out of the Garden of Eden because sin has entered into their lives and brought death upon them, brought all of the crud that goes with sin, all of the guilt, all of the condemnation, all of the bad stuff that sin causes in our lives. As they're headed out for that, 
God speaks to Satan the tempter, the serpent. And he says that there will be a singular masculine offspring of the woman who will crush or bruise the head of Satan, even as Satan bruises his heel. So it won't be without cost to the offspring of woman. And with that prophetic word, we began to see unfolding a series of events, a series of statements, a series of characters that foreshadow who Jesus the Messiah is going to be so that the people would recognize him when he came. We know from this first he's going to be from the offspring of woman. We know that he's going to be masculine, that he's going to be one Messiah. And you can continue to, to march through these stories in the Old Testament. You can read about Abraham and how God comes to Abraham and says, In you all of the families of the earth shall be blessed. The blessing's going to come from the seed of Abraham. So now we know it's not only coming from woman, but we know it's the Messiah. He is specifically going to be an Israelite. He's going to be from the seed of Abraham. As it continues to chart through, there are more and more and more prophecies. And then you finally get to Moses. And Moses, some people might even think maybe Moses is Messiah because Moses was mighty indeed. He met with the Lord on Mount Sinai. God gave him the law. God used him miraculously to lead the people out of slavery. You might think Moses is the one, but Moses says that God is going to raise up a prophet like Moses. Moses repeats to Israel what God said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. My PowerPoint has the reference wrong. This is in Exodus. Actually in Deuteronomy. Excuse me. Not Genesis. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth. And he shall speak to them all that I command him. And so God tells Moses, and Moses tells the people that a Messiah is coming and that he's going to be like Moses in the sense that he, he knows God. He's going to have the words of God in his mouth, not simply on tablets that have been written. He's going to speak to the people everything that God wants spoken. And so we have this continued continued, continued illustration of God telling them what the Messiah is going to look like. Now there have been bukus of people. The question becomes, who's the promised Messiah? Have we found him today? Has he come yet? Was he Jesus? That is the question that John answers in his gospel. John says specifically that he's written his gospel so that people may have faith or believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Christ is just the Greek word for Messiah. That Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you'll have life in his name. There's a lot to unpack in those verses there that surround this John 20, 31 verse I've put on the PowerPoint. And we'll do that at some point, I hope, in this class. But right now, this is an introductory lesson. And what I want you to understand is, if you want to know which one is the promised Messiah, John says, all roads lead to Jesus. And when we read the Gospel of John, we're going to read how John shows through Genesis over and over and over again in so many different ways the road leads to Jesus. We're going to see how he shows it's true with Adam. 
We're going to see how he shows it's true with Abraham. It's true with Isaac. It's true with Jacob. It's true as you move past Genesis into Exodus. And John's going to show how Exodus, the road through Exodus is a road that leads straight to Jesus. Moses leads to Jesus. The festivals that Moses put in place. The festival of Booth, Sukkot, leads to Jesus. The festival of the Passover, Pesach, leads to Jesus. The festival of Hanukkah. Ah, 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 Moses didn't put that in place. <laughs> Tricked you. That comes into place after the close of the Old Testament. But it still points to Jesus. I just threw it in there because it was a festival. <laughs> You'll find throughout the Old Testament, but especially in Exodus, this comment, ego a me. That's Greek, means I am, with an emphasis on I. We'll talk about that later in class today, but that road leads to Jesus. The tabernacle that Moses has the people build as a central place of worship, where God will meet with the people where sacrifices will be done to make God and people live in love and harmony justly, justly. We don't live in harmony with God simply because, eh, he lets our sin slide. He's a just God, and so justice has to be done with our sin for us to live in harmony with him. But that's done in a figurative way at the tabernacle. And John explains how that road leads straight to Jesus. The manna that comes down to feed Israel on their wanderings through the wilderness speaks of Jesus. We can continue through Joshua, Judges, Ruth, but you get to King David. And that road leads to Jesus because someone from the line of David is going to sit on his throne forever. And that road leads to Jesus, not just David, but the Psalms point to Jesus. The prophets point to Jesus. And John takes all of this and shows how all of these roads lead to the crucified Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus. And that's the thrust of the Gospel of John. That's it in a smashing overview, and that's a good bit of what we'll cover during this series. By the way, pray for next Sunday. Becky and I have to be at an event. We don't miss class easily or lightly, but have I got someone teaching for me? You've heard him preach. Sometimes you've heard him teach, but he is an incredible teacher who's going to dig into the first 14 verses or so of John, or maybe eight verses. I don't remember how many. So come here, Pastor David, teach this class next Sunday. Show him some love, show him some support. And uh, my thanks to him for doing that on top of everything else he's got to do. Um, this is what we're doing in this class. Now, since this is the introductory lesson, a fair thing to do is to say, okay, I've got the gospel of John, but I want some questions answered. I want to know who, where, how, why, what. Let me tell you that if you were at uh, seminary and you were taking a class on, on a New Testament survey, one of the things that they would teach you is that there are, let me make this a little bit bigger. That there are, well, we know this. I'll bet most everybody in here already knows there are four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are the four, the four Gospels. Now, out of those four Gospels, three of them are called synoptic Gospels. It's a fancy word. It comes from two Greek words. 
It comes from the Greek word soon. Soon, there we go. And soon means um, with, kind of, sort of. Plus, a Greek word, optikos. It means how something looks. It's visual. It's looking. These are called synoptic gospels, three of these, because they basically see things the same way. They tell the same basic stories. They use the same basic language. And they see things the same way. Those synoptic gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Okay? John is not a synoptic gospel. John tells different stories. John tells different narratives. John is structured differently. John drives home different points. And John is much more theological in some ways. So if that's the case, it's a fair question to say, why? I mean, John kind of stands out like a, not a sore thumb, but a thumb. And for a long time, during a hypercritical period of history, skeptics of the Bible would point to John and say, well, John must have been written by somebody who had no knowledge of anything going on. That's not a fair thing to say. It's not an accurate thing to say. In fact, the, the many scholars, if they had been resurrected from the grave, would have been embarrassed to find out that the John Ryland's fragment, it's called P52. P means papyrus. 52 is the number that's arbitrarily assigned. The John Ryland's fragment that was found in the deserts of Egypt that dates back to within 25, 35 years of John writing his gospel is the oldest copy we have of any New Testament text. And it tells you that the Gospel of John is an ancient document because we've got a, a portion of it that dates from about 125 A.D. But it's a fair question to say, how direct is the path from the events that happened in the life of Jesus to the Gospel itself? And since this is an overview class, I want us to have some confidence in what we're reading so we need to dig in a little bit to what we know about the gospel and how direct that path is. I would suggest it's as direct as the A to B line that I've got in the PowerPoint illustration. Let's construct a, a timeline together and let's see if we can come up with some way of putting this into a perspective we can see and hang on to. The first event that we'll put on the timeline is from 30 to 33 A.D., We've got the life and ministry of Jesus. So if Jesus dies around 33 AD, give or take, then that's one point in our timeline. His ministry lasted for three years before his death, roughly. So we've got the ministry and events that John covers and the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus during that time period. Now, Jesus, during that time period, chose his apostles and specifically said that the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you and is going to speak through you to remind and to teach and to call people to the kingdom. So one of his apostles, the youngest of the set, was an extended relative named John likely a cousin, not John the Baptist, who was also a cousin, but another cousin. And John, a young cousin 
of Jesus is one of the 12. Church history teaches that John, after the fall of Jerusalem in the Roman rebellion in 60 AD, John went to Ephesus, which is in Turkey, on the coast of Turkey, modern Turkey, went to Ephesus where he continued to minister and to teach. And so we have John ministering in Ephesus from about 60 through the 90s until he dies. For a short time he goes also offshore Ephesus to the island of Patmos where he is uh, uh, um, in essence incarcerated by being sent to a desolate island. John, somewhere in the 90s, writes the gospel. The other three gospels have already been written by the time John writes his gospel. We know about this, including from a number of different sources, but one of the preeminent sources is from a fella named Polycarp. Now, Polycarp was also from the same area of Ephesus where John spent his last three decades living and teaching and ministering and serving. We have from Polycarp a reference to him as follows. And this is from one of Polycarp's students. I remember the events of that time more clearly than those of recent years. By the way, as you get older, a lot of us can make that statement. <laughs> I remember the events of that time more clearly than those of recent years. For what boys learn growing with their mind becomes joined with it. So I'm able to describe the very place in which the blessed Polycarp sat as he discoursed. And his goings out and his comings in and the manner of his life and his physical appearance and his discourses, what he had to say to the people and the accounts which he gave of his intercourse, his interactions with John and the others who had seen the Lord. And as he remembered their words... And what he heard from them concerning the Lord and concerning his miracles and concerning his teaching, having received them from eyewitnesses of the word of life, which is a phrase John uses, Polycarp related all things in harmony with the scriptures. So we know about John's influence on Polycarp. We know about Polycarp's witness. But Polycarp had a student named Irenaeus. And Irenaeus would talk about it as well and says, uh, afterwards, John, the disciple of the Lord, who had also leaned upon his breast, Jesus' breast, did himself publish a gospel during his residence at Ephesus in Asia. So we've got within less than a, a, a lifespan, witnesses who were both with John for decades, but also who passed on this information to their students. We have good, reliable authority, is what I'm telling you, that upholds the biblical tradition of John writing his gospel and writing it from Ephesus. It's not just from those. You can go to Clement of Alexandria. Alexandria is in Egypt. Alexandria is near where they found the fragment of the Gospel of John that dates from about 125 AD. And one of the church leaders there, Clement of Alexandria, is recorded as saying, but last of all, after Matthew, Mark, and Luke, John perceiving that the eternal, external facts had been made plain in the Gospels. You know, well, you've already got the virgin birth. You've already got the, the basics, the one, two, threes. You've got the basic stories. You've got all of that. John being urged by his friends and inspired by the Spirit composed a spiritual gospel 
The word spiritual in the Greek is pneumaticos. Pneumaticos means, um, uh, it, it can mean spiritual. Pneuma is spirit. And the ekos ending at the end of it, the tikos ending, means in essence making it an adverb. So it's, it's spiritually uh, 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 there. It's a spiritual gospel. Um, it's a gospel that, that, that is not only inspired by the Spirit, but speaks to the things of God. And so this is what we're looking at when we look at this. We are looking at a gospel which is an authoritative gospel inspired by the Spirit of God, recognized by the earliest church from an eyewitness of Jesus who wrote after the other three gospels, in essence, to supplement them. Now, the gospel of John, I told you, has some greater theology. Greater is a bad word to use. Has a, a more developed theology than the other gospels. And it makes sense. Understand if John's writing from Ephesus in the 90s, he's been in a church home for three decades that was the church home that collected Paul's letters and put them all together. It's the church home that received that letter that went around to neighboring churches that we call Ephesians. And you can see the effect that that has on the Gospel of John because John uses language that you'll find nowhere else in the Bible except in Paul's letter to the Ephesians because that was language that the people knew. See, John's writing his gospel after a time where the church has had the great theologian Paul, where the church has had a chance to develop and understand theology, and so it's decades later from the earlier gospels, and he writes it in a way that teaches these spiritual truths. It's an incredibly valuable tool for us to not only learn who Jesus is in a basic sense, but to dive deep into who Jesus is as well. So that's what we're going to do in this class. What I'd like to do today is give you just a, an inkling. I want to entice you to come back. I want to entice you to dig into this study with me. I want to entice you to know that it doesn't matter how long you've been reading John, how long you've been reading the Bible, there, is, there are nuggets in there that I can assure you will be fresh for you. Let me just talk in general about three of them this morning. And again, this is a stone skipping on the water. We will dig into this in much greater detail over the weeks to come. But the first one is... I want to talk to you about Genesis and how Genesis is manifested in the Gospel of John. Now, one is an easy one, and I won't spend much time on it because Pastor David will be teaching on it next week. That's in the beginning. That's the way Genesis starts. To make sure we're all on the same page with this, Genesis, let's do it in green, Genesis is written in Hebrew. All right? So Genesis starts out with Hebrew. In Hebrew, it says Bareshit, which means in the beginning. Uh, just one G. I can't spell beginning. Someone asked me the other day, how do you spell... I don't know, it was an elephant or something, and I misspelled it. No. And they said, that's wrong. And I said, well, no, it's not. You asked me how I spell it. You didn't ask me. <laughs> you didn't ask me the right way to spell it. Get your question right. In the big inning. Some people think that's the start of a baseball game. In the big inning. Um, in the beginning. That's how it starts. Now, about 200 years before Jesus was born or incarnated, 200 years before, there's a library in Alexandria, Egypt. It's the largest library in the world. 
And it's mainly books in Greek. Alexandria is a city in Egypt, but it's named after its founder, Alexander the Great. And he took Greek culture and he took Greek language throughout the Mediterranean world, including Egypt. You might recall Alexander the Great had been a student of Aristotle. So he was quite familiar with Greek language and Greek culture. And one of the things the library at Alexandria did is they tried to commission great works to be translated into Greek. Among those great works commissioned was a translation of the Hebrew Old Testament books into Greek. And so Genesis, Hebrew, gets translated into Greek. And that Hebrew, Bereshit, gets translated into Greek and it becomes in RK. In R K. Uh, I forgot where the accent goes. I can't spell in Greek either. It's like either here or here, though. Let's throw it over here. In R K. Now, that gets done 200 years before Jesus is born. You with me? That is what's called the Septuagint. Septuagint. It is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Now by the time Paul and Jesus are around, it's widely used throughout the Mediterranean world among all the Jews. By this point in time, many Jews are much more familiar with Greek, especially outside of Jerusalem, than they are with their native tongue. Just think about it in terms of, of here. In Texas, for example, we have a large portion of our population that has immigrated from the Latin American countries, Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, Colombia, Lots of them. And when the first generation comes and lives in a predominantly English-speaking culture, those people either learn English or already have some English, but they're really good at keeping their Spanish. Then they have children born here. And the children born here may hear Spanish at home as a primary language, but they hear English at school. And they become much more fluent in English. I mean, come on, think about high school kids. Compare how much they talk to their friends to how much they talk to their parents. <laughs> Except for ours. Um, the, 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 the influence is huge. Now go another generation. The grandchildren of the immigrants oftentimes are fortunate to speak much Spanish at all. I have two great guys that have worked with me for 30 years. One is named Juan and one is named Jesse. They both have Latino origins. Juan is able to speak Spanish. I don't think Jesse can count to 10 in Spanish. <laughs> and everybody, you know, just immediately assumes he can because he's of Latino heritage and his name's Jesse, and, and you would just think, and he's, he's like looking to Juan to translate because he's got no clue. Third generation. Add fourth generation, fifth generation, sixth generation. And you understand now why hundreds of years later, most Jews are embracing the Greek version of their scriptures instead of the Hebrew. They don't understand the Hebrew nearly as well. My buddy Rick Meadows here today. Where's Rick? Waving his hand. Rick's Jewish. Now Rick can read some of the Hebrew stuff, but don't ask him to translate it. He's useless. <laughs> but he can read the English, and he can read the Hebrew. He just doesn't know what it means half the time. So here's what you've got. 
you've got a people that even Paul uses the Greek version of the Old Testament when he's on his mission work. In his letters, he quotes from a Greek translation of the Old Testament. He studied at the foot of one of the greatest rabbis of all of history in, 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 in Israel, Rabbi Gamaliel, who himself said that the Greek version of the Old Testament should be used among the masses. And he viewed it as an inspired version. Now, why do I say this? Because John starts his gospel. Let's do the gospel of John in, I'm running out of colors. We'll do the gospel of John in orange. So John starts his gospel. And he's not writing in Hebrew, but he's writing in Greek. And he starts it out in R.K., Exactly the way Genesis starts, in the beginning. But he doesn't start it out with, in the beginning, God created. Instead, he begins, in the beginning, the Word was the Word. In our case, hein hologos. In the beginning was the Word. It's the same parallel structure, though. And Pastor David will get into that more. That's a, that's a gimme for John using Genesis. Let me give you one that's not a gimme. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. Did you know that the structure of John is structured on Genesis in some ways? So in Genesis, we read, here's the structure of John. Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in these book, but these seven, there are seven miracles Jesus does in John. He does lots more miracles than that in all the other gospels. And John's saying, look, he did lots more than this. But I've chosen seven of them. These seven, these that I've written are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah. These seven, seven, huh, seven miracles, huh, things that make you go, huh. God created the world in seven days. Say, yeah, no, technically he created in six. The seventh was a day of rest. Not in Jewish thought. In Jewish thought, the seventh is a miraculous day as well. And those of you who have jobs where you never get any rest know what a miracle it is to have a day of rest. The Sabbath is a miracle. It's a day of rest. So you've got seven days of miracles. God creates the world in seven days. Jesus has seven miracles that John writes about. The first one is changing water to wine. The second, he heals the official son. The third, he heals at the pool of Bethesda. The fourth, he feeds the 5,000. The fifth, he walks on water. The sixth, he heals a blind man. And the seventh, he raises Lazarus from the dead. Those are the seven miracles. They, they, there are seven of them and then the, at the end of those seven, Jesus dies and Jesus is resurrected, a miracle of God the Father. And then the women find Jesus. Where do they find him? In the garden. And they mistake him for being a gardener. Because after seven days of creation, Paul, uh, John wants us to see. After seven days of creation, if we're reading in Genesis, we get to the Garden of Eden and Adam is there and he's been told to work and keep the fields. He's a gardener. In Jesus, the new Adam is confused as a gardener. And so you're going to find the, 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 the threads of the tapestry woven not only from Genesis, but deep into John in subtle ways as well as rich ways. So that gives you an idea. Let me go a little bit further. Let's look at Moses for a moment. And again, we'll get into this in a lot more depth later. But the Moses story, it's over and over and over in Scripture. In John 1, um, uh, I won't put all of these up. I'll read them to you in the interest of time. But let me give you a few of these. John 1, 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word dwelt there is the word that means tabernacled. 
It's a reference back to the tabernacle experience that Moses had. It's a subtle one. We'll get into more depth, but let's keep going because John is not always subtle. Verse 17, for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The law was true. But it was the law. It wasn't expanded. It wasn't expounded. It wasn't full. Uh, the, the, the truth of, of, of reality and everything else. The truth and grace that was even in the law came through Jesus Christ. And John gives that contrast in stark terms. Verse 28 and 29 is where John the Baptist is baptizing and the next day he sees Jesus coming towards him and he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb of God as a sacrifice was instituted by Moses. But all it would do is buy a temporary reprieve from sin for that person offering the Lamb. Jesus is greater. Jesus is the Lamb of God that is offered for the sin of the entire world. Not past sin, all sin. And the contrast is there. Verse 45. Philip finds Nathanael and says, We found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God. Moses wrote about Jesus. If you go to John 3.14, John 3.16, I'll bet a lot of you quote. But John 3.14 is before that. Nicodemus is talking to Jesus. And Nicodemus is a leader of the people. He's a Jewish rabbi. He's a, 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 a Pharisee. He's a, he's a, he is well read. He is steeped in the scriptures. And Jesus says to him, are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you don't understand these things that Jesus was saying? He said, I want to tell you something. We speak of what we know. We bear witness to what we've seen, but you're not receiving our testimony. If I told you earthly things and you don't believe me, how can you believe if I answer your heavenly questions? No one has ascended into heaven except the Son of Man. And as, Mo which is Jesus, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Moses, when the people are sick, they construct a serpent that he holds up on his staff and he lifts it up. And anybody who sees it is cured. They have their life back, but they all died. Jesus, in like manner, is going to be lifted up, but Jesus is going to give an eternal life. And so you see that contrast that John continues as he continues to illustrate the effect of Moses in comparison and contrast and support of Jesus. If you go to John 5, 45 and 46, you see it again. Jesus says, don't think I will accuse you to the Father. The one who accuses you is Moses, on whom you set your hope. If you believed Moses, you'd believe me, because he wrote about me. If you don't believe his writings, you're not going to believe my words. Again, this is John showing through Moses the roads lead to Jesus. John 6, 32 is another example. Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, it wasn't Moses who gave you the manna. It was my father. And he's the one who gives you the true bread from heaven, which is Jesus. The true sustenance to get us through the wilderness in which we live. Is what God the Father does. So this is a good example, just a smattering example of how Moses is a theme throughout John. Let me give you in the short time we've got. Hold on, I have to put these on to see the clock. Oh yeah, man, we're rolling. We got seven minutes. Let me give you, let me give you a couple of more. 
Let's go to the ego a me. Now, ego a me is helpful for us to get to right now because you remember I told you that the Old Testament got translated into Greek in the Septuagint. There is a critical passage in the Old Testament, and it's not in Genesis, it's actually in Exodus. But it is the passage where Moses is in front of the burning bush. And God says to Moses, take your sandals off, you're on holy ground. And the bush is burning, but it's not being consumed. And, and, and Moses says, you know, help me. I'm, I'm having this encounter with God. What, what's going on? And God says to Moses, I want you to go down. I want you to tell the people. I want you to tell the Pharaoh. I'm calling my people out of Egypt. It's time. And Moses says, well, there's lots of problems with this, God. I'm not sure you've really thought this through. Uh, that, that's really kind of what he says. He doesn't say it quite so boldly, but you'll see that's what he says. I mean, you're, God, you know, you got to find somebody who, that's a great idea, great idea, but <laughs> wrong guy, uh, not me. I'm a wanted man there, and that's not, you know, you're, seriously, you need to think this through. Don't go off half-cocked on these crazy ideas, God. And uh, God says, no, 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 it's not half-cocked, it's not half-baked. I've, I've got this planned. This is the way we're going to do it. And I'm going to take you down there and we're going to get it done. Moses said, well, for starters, they're going to want to know your name. I, Egypt's a place with thousands of gods. They're going to want to know your name. And God says, I am who I am. God declares his name is Yahweh. Now, when God says, I am who I am, or I am that I am, that gets translated into Greek. And in Greek, it gets translated into two different ways of saying I am. But the first one right out of the box is ego, a me. I am. And I am is the name of God. Now, that's a strong statement. If we go back to the PowerPoint, this is where you find it in Exodus 3. God said to Moses, I am, ego a me in Greek, who I am. The name of God becomes so holy to Israel. In the Ten Commandments, they're told not to take the name of God lightly. Now, that means a whole lot more than simply don't say God means a whole lot more. But it was also understood to where you do not pronounce the name of God as an Israelite or as a Jew. And so by the time of, of, of Jesus, you've got some writings like these. The top is a picture of the um, Habakkuk Pesher. Pesher is a Jewish word. means a commentary. It's a commentary on the Old Testament prophet Habakkuk. And if you were reading Hebrew letters, if I had Rick Meadow up here, Rick Meadow would be able to read you the Hebrew, except for that part that's circled. And the reason why is because that's the name of God. That's Yahweh. Yod, Hey, Vav, Hey. But it's not written in the typical Aramaic script of Hebrew at the time of Jesus. Instead, it's written in a script that is called Paleo-Hebrew. It's Hebrew that's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and a thousand years older. It's Hebrew that might have been used much more near the time of Moses. It's the oldest Hebrew script they knew. And so they would write the name of God in that script in part so people would not pronounce it and they would recognize it. You do not say the name of God or lightning strikes. If you look at the bottom, the bottom is from the scroll of discipline, the manual of discipline in the Dead Sea Scroll community at the time of Jesus. And the four letters that should have, it's quoting a passage out of the Bible, the four letters that should have Yahweh, they didn't even write them down in the old Hebrew script. They just put four dots there. Those are those four dots. Because you don't say the name of God. You don't pronounce the name of God. It is not to be done. 
But this is what happened. And, and, and you see this used over and over in the Old Testament. And we'll dig into this when we get there. But God says, I am, I am, I am, I am. You say, well, surely they said that a lot. You know, that's just the present tense. No, Hebrew doesn't even have a present tense. This I am statement that's used over and over and over again is echoed by Jesus over and over and over again. And when Jesus echoes these statements, he does it. One time he gets stoned. They want to stone him. He escapes for blasphemy. But Jesus makes it real clear. Jesus says, I have manifested the name of God. Manifested means I've, I have become it. I have shown it. I have, manif- I have manifested your name. Ego a me. I have become your name. To the people whom you gave me out of this world. I've made known to them your name. And I'll continue to make it known. That the love with which you've loved me may be in them. And I in them. And so Jesus makes, some people say, you know, Jesus never technically said he was divine. Oh, yes, he does. If you don't think he says he's divine, you're not reading it in the original language or you're not reading it with understanding. Jesus leaves no doubt, John leaves no doubt in anybody's mind. So I'm excited to dig into this gospel with you. We're going to have such a marvelous, marvelous chance to grow before the Lord. I think it'll help change our lives. But for today, I've got you a little bit of take home to take away for lunch. No sweet and sour chicken. First take home, Jesus, he's plan A. He was never God's plan B. God knew from the creation of the world what was going to happen. And God planned from the creation of the world what he was going to do about it. Jesus wasn't an afterthought because Jesus, in the beginning, God created, but also in the beginning, already was the Word. Jesus was there. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Jesus was never plan B. Jesus wasn't an afterthought. Jesus wasn't a ripcord for a parachute. Now, what does that mean for you and me? That means that whatever we need in our life, God knew about it long before we were born and has already seen fit to provide it. If you are in need in your life, you can rest 100% assured that God answers that need. That doesn't make it easy. That doesn't make it, oh, now, you know, it's all blue skies and rainbows. But the answers are there. The, the comfort, the, 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 the comforter, the one walking with you. And it also means this is another part of what Pastor Stephen was talking about this morning on the importance of us being a body. If I hit my finger with a hammer... Do you know what I do? Hmm. Thankfully, I have a mouth. I don't know why. I don't know if that like makes it feel any better, but I automatically stick it in my mouth. I'm just telling you that part of what we do as a body is we love and help each other. When you walk out of here today, please don't walk out without saying hi to someone next to you. And if you even remotely perceive there's a way you can minister to them other than saying hi, do it. If you've got more lunch than you can eat and you run into someone who may want to eat lunch with you or may need someone to eat lunch with, ask them. Love on them. Let them see what we are because God has provided for us. It's always plan A with him and we are to be his hands and feet and provide for others. Point for home number two, Jesus is a complete answer. I mean, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Jesus is not part of the answer to part of the problems and part of your life. He's the full answer. You look to him for your life, and you have life. 
You look to him for your answers. You'll get your answers. In humility, come before the Lord and seek the Lord. In this world, we'll have tribulation. But we can be of good cheer because he's overcome the world. And we can find a peace that passes understanding when we embrace the Lord of peace. Final point for home, Jesus is resurrected. Jesus says, you know, I'm going to destroy this temple where God would meet with the people and their sacrifices and the whole temple system. And in three days, I'll raise it up. Won't be a temple made with bricks. Won't be a temple made with stones. Won't be a temple made with human hands. God will meet with us in Jesus, the resurrected King, the Messiah. So with that, let me bless you in the name of Jesus. And I pray that you have a good day. Father, we do pray in the name of Jesus a blessing on all who hear this message. Thank you, Father, for our visitors. But thank you also for, for who you are and the way you show us love. Father, if people learn nothing else from us, may they learn from the way we treat them that you are a God of love and mercy and compassion who seeks to, to commune with us. Bless everyone who hears this message, Father. Woo them to you. Amen. Amen.